Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metrology Matters. I'm your host, Tyler Kern. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the podcast today. Today, we're bringing you the introduction to laser interferometry, and we have two subject matter experts joining us for this discussion that we are thrilled to introduce to you right now. First, we have Kate Medicus. She is the CEO of Ruta Cardinal. Kate, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We are uh, thrilled to have you. And we also have Bruce Truax. He's the Director of Engineering at Zygo. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Kate, let's start off with you. For an inexperienced user that wants to characterize the surface of an optic, where do they start? Give us some uh, some details there. Right. So, so uh, one of the things that we know about that uh, to characterize the surface of the optic, we want to know it in really, really, really fine detail. And the, the best tool to use that is a, a laser interferometer. And the best tool to that is on the market that one can purchase is a Fizeau laser interferometer. And it's um, a principle by which uh, a the interferometer sends out a reference wave and, and then, or it actually sends out a wave of light and then it reflects off the optic and it compares it to a reference wave inside the instrument. And the difference between those two waves of light will tell you about the shape of the optic. So for an inexperienced user, you got to learn a little bit about how the interferometry works, about how the instruments work so you can set your optic up right and so you can set it in the right condition so you can get a good measurement. But that's really the best way uh, to do it. That's the best start of characterizing the optic. And interferometry is great because it works for like all good optics. Well, Bruce, you heard uh, you heard what Kate said there. Uh, is there anything that you want to add, or uh, you know, add your own perspective to uh, to her comments? Well, I'll just say that I mean, an inexperienced user who's never done interferometry before should get a demonstration by somebody who knows how it works. And I would strongly recommend that they, you know, contact a salesperson, or even better, go to a trade show where they can get some hands-on time. Um, and look at the various vendors and the various types of interferometers. And, and I think if they do that, they'll get a good feeling for how interferometry works and how sensitive it is. There's really there's really something to be said about learning from somebody who has done it before. It's a, it's a fairly specialized um, measurement tool, so it can't be just learned from a book, and you really do want to learn from somebody that has been... Uh, been through it before. Absolutely. That that hands-on experience can be I- extremely valuable. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so Bruce, you know, this is uh, introduction to interferometry or introduction to laser interferometry after all. So, uh, let's start off uh, or let's follow that up with a question that is just, how does interferometry work in the first place? Okay. Well, it's a little difficult to explain without visual aids, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, First, I'd like the listeners to picture a topographic contour map that many are familiar with from hiking. Um, Such maps have contours that are typically separated by, say, 10 meters in vertical height or 100 feet. And um, now that you've got that picture in your mind, let's talk about interferometry. It's very similar. Um, When you have the interference that Kate talked about, where you send a wave out to a reference surface and you send another um, wave of, uh, that that gets split and the light hits your test surface and they come back and they get recombined, they form essentially a contour map on the surface. When the light interferes, you get dark and light bands. And the separation of those bands is a half a wavelength of light, which is about 0.31 microns. Uh, and that contour map is then read by the sensor in the interferometer and converted into heights. Um, that's, that's a simple way of looking at it. Um, the interferometer actually has the ability to divide those contours down into very small divisions, and the vertical sensitivity is on the order of a tenth of a nanometer or better. So interferometers can do extremely high precision measurements of optical surfaces. I think it's important to know that interferometry in general is a is a scientific principle that's used in many different applications. Um, you uh, looking at 
getting more accurate pictures of stars in, in, in astronomy. But in this case, what we're talking a lot about here is measuring uh, using laser, laser interferometry to measure a full surface of an optic. So um, there's sometimes laser interferometry is just used to measure like a single position in space, but we want to measure that full surface of the optic, that that topographic map that Bruce just talked about, and really understand what that surface looks like. Because once we know that surface map, that topographic map, we then know if that optic that we manufactured is good. And is it good enough to be used in its final application, or do we need to do some more manufacturing process to make it better? Kate, I think it might be worth it for you to mention, for you making optics, how good do they typically need to be? Right. So so I, it all depends on the application. Let's talk about optics that are used to make semiconductors. So the the computer chips that are in all of our cell phones, in almost every electronic device that we have, those are manufactured on, on machines that use optics. Now, these optics need to be the best optics on, on the world. In, in the world. They need to be perfectly flat. If you're, if you're thinking about a sphere, they need to be so perfectly flat. There needs to be zero deviation from them. And we use interferometry to do that. Interferometry is still absolutely the best tool to be able to measure that. And what we're talking about when we want how good they need to be, it needs to be good to less than a nanometer. And we're measuring, so nanometers are times 10 to the minus nine of a, of a meter. You can't even picture in your head what a nanometer looks like. No, nobody can. So um, what's wonderful about interferometry is, is it's really the only tool that we have to be able to measure that accurately. It, uh, it, it was first, interferometry was first used around the turn of the 19th, um, 1900s, but, uh, and it's still the same scientific principle now, but what allows it to be used to that level of accuracy is the, um, is the cameras that we have, the sensors that we have, and, uh, and it's a weird chicken and egg problem, actually. To, to make really good interferometers, you need to make really good optics. To make good optics, you need good interferometers. So they actually get better and better. And, Zygo, of course, has, knows that uh, in, intimately, that problem. So, so Kate, you, did, um, you, you started to kind of explain a little bit of this uh, a moment ago when you were talking about uh, manufacturing chips that go in, you know, cell phones, electronics, that sort of thing. Uh, that, that goes a long way in explaining why interferometry is, is so important. But uh, go into a little bit more detail about that uh, and just why interferometry is so important to uh, maybe to everybody, to our daily lives. Right. So, you know, in general, the company that I work for is we are an optics uh, design and assembly firm. So we make optics for many different industries. And we talk about all the optics that we made and how we assemble them. They're different from our eyeglasses optics. They're, they have to be made in much more precision manners. But in the, in the sense of what do those optics do? In many cases, the same things that they do for your eyeglasses. The eyeglasses help correct any aberrations that you see so your eye can work better. Your eye is just an optical system. Sometimes we have to put a corrector in front of it for those of us that can't see very well. I have contacts. Mine, mine are even smaller in there. But so that just shows us there's different ways of solving the same problem in optics. You know, you can manufacture them or in, in glass or in that. With the interferometry, we use the interferometry to, ma to manufacture all of the optics that we use in different optical systems. Different optical systems are used in military applications, both for defense and offense applications, scientific exploration. We're right now building a tool that is, is used to measure uh, bacteria and viruses in, in biological samples. It's an optical instrument. It's a box can't see inside the box. The average user, the average doctor wouldn't see what's behind it. But in there, there's a whole stack of optics. And all of those optics were made using, me made and measured using interferometry. And that is why it's a core technology to allow us to build onto so many other te technologies. The pictures that we see from the recent Mars rover, which is 
totally exciting. We're getting images and video from um, from a different planet. All of those optics were manufactured and measured using interferometry. So it's it's one of those um, technologies that nobody knows that it's happening, but it's absolutely critical to to being able to reach those high precision levels and to be able to um, see literally all of the things that we can't see without the optics. Bruce, anything you want to add on to, uh, to Kate's comments? Yeah, I mean, I'll, she makes a very good point about how good optics have to be um, for some of the most critical applications. But even, even the phones that are in your pocket that have two or three cameras on them are measured with interferometry, and, and they don't need to be quite as good as the lithography optics, but they're still better than a wavelength of light. So you're still talking about surfaces that need to be good to, um, in those cases, probably a tenth of a, a micron. Um, so there's a wide variety um, of products that use optics now. In fact, if we look at the markets in the past 20 years, the market for optics has, has just exploded. Um, you know, you may have had one or two cameras in your household when you were, um, you know, 20 years ago. Now there's like five cameras on this phone um, and you've got them in your car for backup cameras and and, and your doorbell, and, your doorbell and, and everything. So and 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 that what was that video game system that was that was you could yeah. use your hands with. So were, yeah. Oh yeah. So the yeah. I think the point is that um, as Kate said, this is an enabling technology that allows people to make optics, um, and it's necessary for any of those applications. So if we stay on the topic of optics, uh, which uh, I think is really important, um, you know, and we talk about the, the topic of an optic that we want to measure, what are some key considerations for optical surface form metrology? Bruce, let me kick this to you first. All right. Well, that's a very open-ended question. You can open the door to a lot of topics, but um, let's just discuss a few. Uh, if you recall earlier, we discussed how an interferometer works and that they have these contour lines separated by, say, a third of a micron. And at this level, the local environment is critical. You're trying to measure things that are um, extremely small. So not only does the interferometer measure your part, but it also measures a lot of other things like vibration, um, like the heat in the air between the um, reference part and the test part. Um, it measures the deformation of a small optic just due to small temperature changes because somebody picked it up with their hand. Uh, so I think one of the things that's critical for uh, people that things they have to consider is you need to control the environment when you're using interferometers. Um, and your interferometer supplier can provide some good guidance on how to do that. But the first time you use an interferometer in your shop, you will probably notice many of these things. And um, it's going to be important for you to learn how to control them. Um, also, in our earlier discussion, I mentioned and Kate mentioned that an interferometer compares the light from your test part with a reference surface. And it's the difference between these two surfaces that are measured. You're not measuring the absolute height of a surface. You're measuring the difference between the reference that is provided by the interferometer manufacturer and the part that you're testing. So the other thing that's important is that the quality of the reference optics that you purchase from the interferometer vendor have to be good enough for the parts that you're testing. Um, Zygo happens to make reference optics of many different quality levels, starting the, the, the worst that we make are about 60 nanometers um, of error, and the best are better than six nanometers. And the user needs to select the ones which are appropriate um, for what they need and also within their budget. So one of the when I was getting taught interferometry way back when I was a little intern, it was it was in the dark room and it had had those plastic sheets all around the table. 
And I'm like, okay, it's a little sketchy. And they're, they, they, uh, they're, and, and, and the table is also floating. So you press the table and it floats up and down and you're like, what in the world is going on? And they're like, it's for all the reasons that Bruce just said. You have to control the environment. Vibration from the floors can change the interferometric measurement. Uh, they, they, got, they taught me how to, how to test for all these things and how to play with it. And if you kick the floor just, just like that, right next to the interferometer, you will see it in the measurement. You will see the fringes dance. So you could blow across the cavity where, where it was in the measurement and you can see it change. And so it, 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 it's really critical and how, and, and, and really teaches, taught me how important controlling that environment is. I, you know, how many times we're taking measurements with a partner, working with a partner and we're like, all right, ready to take measurements, hands up. So you're not making sure, making sure you're the, your partner's not touching the table and that would affect your measurements. So, but it does also depend, there are times that you don't need that high accuracy. You can accept a little bit of vibrational error or a little bit of um, environmental error that you, that, that the parts that you make can, can accept that versus parts that need to be super high precision where as, as Bruce said, you can't even touch the optic. You have to put it in, in, into place, wait four hours, four hours. Then you can take your measurement. And you can't even be in the room when you take your measurement. So it's, it's all about how careful do you need to be. And it's important to consider that beforehand because it's not worth anybody's time and money to be overly cautious and overly careful in that. And we talked about, you know, there's certain, there's a lot of do's and don'ts about how you hold optics and how you put them in front of the interferometer. Interferometers can be mounted sideways. They can be mounted looking up, looking down. All of them have different uh, advantages or dif disadvantages to that. When, if, when interferometers are vertical, it can be really nice because you can set the optic into place and it, and it gives a nice support of, uh, from gravity. When you measure it on the side, it's easy, there's a lot of accessibility and you get do get some other advantages, but one of the most common conditions for mounting when you mount the interferometer on their side, you end up having to hold the optic in a, in a three-jaw chuck. When you hold that optic in a three-jaw chuck, if it's, if it's a very thin optic, the, the three-jaw chuck will create stress and you'll see that in the measurement. And so, um, so you have to be cautious and um, it's very common if, if, you know, person in the know, they see, they see three little stress points in the measurement. And they're like, how, how are you holding that? But somebody new would not know that and would not see it. Then they would try to fix that error and that error was, was not actually there. There's a lot, um, unfortunately, that is one of the one of the key things about interferometry and surface figure interferometry. There's a lot of uh, institutional knowledge and things that I know instinctually about a measurement and see it. Um, you know, if you see comb in a measurement, it's like, mm, is that really? Uh, mm, let's rotate the part. Let's see if that that's really that's really in there. But um, and that and that's where Bruce talks about, you know, going to your 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 equipment supplier, and they're going to know a lot of those and really to really train and listen. There is um, there's a lot of knowledge out there, and it can be it can be learned, but it does have to be learned. I just add one more thing is that the holding of optics is critically important. The holding of the, the parts you're testing, um, but also the the manufacturer of the interferometer equipment. They have a lot of experience with this. Um, and when you buy accessories, at least from Zygo, you will never see the mounting stresses of the optics that we use for references because we've learned over the years how to how to hold them properly and it is really critical that that be done correctly because you don't know whether the customer as Kate said is going to use it looking horizontally or looking down or looking up and um, it's critical that the vendor that you use knows how to do that um, and you know, some people may try, think that the optics are expensive and they try to make them themselves and then they find out where the real problems are um, because it's very difficult to make anything that is good to single-digit nanometers. Um, you just look at it funny and it changes. So 
it's, you know, it is important that you understand all this. And as Kate said, there's a lot of institutional knowledge that when you first start using interferometers, you'll probably struggle. You'll probably distort optics and you'll see them changing over time and you'll wonder which measurement is good. But once you've had some experience, um, you'll start to realize how to do it properly and get the best efficiency out of your test setups. The other, the other thing that I struggle with a little bit is some of the older folks in the industry who may not have had uh, new and modern interferometers. So they tell they tell the old stories. They say, "Ah, oh, I used to make fiftieth wave optics, and I didn't have an interferometer. What are you kids doing nowadays? You can't even make that." And well. They may not have been making those optics when because they couldn't measure them. So it relates to that whole question: it you can't decouple measurement from manufacturing process. So, but that's the uh, that how how it goes. It's up to the to the new kids to show the old kids new ways of doing, and it's up for to us new kids to still learn. I think that's a great balance to strike there, uh, understanding what each side can learn from the other. I think that's a that's a great point. You know, and Kate, you were talking about institutional knowledge, and I, I thought that that was really interesting. And I think that leads us really nicely into our next question. That was, how can I be confident I made a good measurement? Uh, that seems to be something that comes with experience, right? But but share your expertise and your experience here. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that a user can do to, to become confident about their measurement. And I think the first thing to know about interferometry is it's not an absolute given to become confident. You should question every measurement that you take. It's a lot different than uh, looking at your gas gauge or a micrometer or something where you can, where you can have a lot more, more, more confidence and it's it's it is a level of detail that is required for interferometry you can't you can't just say it's going to be absolute uh repeatability are you repeating the measurement are you getting the same measurement R reproducibility are you if you if you change something are you still getting close to the measurement so a reproducibility might be i i mount the part i take the measurement uh what happens if i turn the optic that's a reproduce. Am I reproducing the measurement? If I turn it and I get the same result, just looks like it's turned, then I know I, I get some more confidence about my measurement. You also want to. There's certain settings inside the interferometer that can help you gain some confidence. You want to take. You want to take an appropriate number of averages in in the measurement so that you can have. Um, so you can ha average out environmental factors. You're, um, you want to make sure that you know what your reference optic looks like. So when, when you get a, uh, a reference optic from the instrument supplier, it should come with a picture. It should come with a picture that says, this is what uh, my reference optics looks like. And if you see that in your measurement, you know that you're probably measuring your reference optic not your test optic. So that's a that's an interesting, um, a really simple way to know what am I measuring because interferometry is a comparison measurement. Um, the there's a lot of actual specialty interferometers that that need to get used in certain conditions, like for measuring a spheres, and if it, to get more confidence in those kind of specialty interferometers. We've actually found, I found in my past experience, that you have to measure it on different measurement tools, entirely different modes of measuring. Uh, one tool may may put coma in the in the measurement um, itself when it's not really there, but another tool may put spherical aberration in it. And if you measure it on both tools, uh, which is a very expensive prospect, mind you, uh, then you can know which one is right or not right. And Bruce knows exactly which tool puts coma in and exactly which tools put spherical in. <laughs> I, and I'd like to add to what Kate said. Um, you know, averaging is um, something that you have to do with interferometry. And um, she's right. It aver you want to average down the environmental effects. And the better your environment is to start, the fewer averages you need to take. Um, the simplest way to do that is to take data with increasing number of averages. Um, say, take 
two sets of data with four averages and subtract them. Then take two sets of data with eight averages and subtract them. And, and then you plot out the difference values and they'll level out at some point. And that'll tell you how many averages you need to take. Um, you know, we try to help our customers be more confident in the results. And we actually provide a function called smart averaging, where we do a lot of that math during the averaging process. So if you set up smart averaging and you say, I need it to be good to one nanometer, and you press the button and walk away, and it'll take the number of averages you need to get down to that point. But even with that, you may want to do some experiments on your own to convince yourself that that is indeed the case. Um, the other thing that I would like to recommend is if you have a micrometer in your shop or you have um, a coordinate measuring machine, you periodically get that recalibrated. You get somebody to come in and they bring in special artifacts and they measure them and they make sure that they're calibrated. And the same thing should be done with optical accessories. They should be recalibrated periodically. Either You can either do that yourself, there's techniques to do that, or you can send them to the manufacturer and they'll redo it. Um, and what you hope to find is that it looks the same as it did when you bought it. And most of the time that is the case. And some people say, well, I've had this recalibrated five times. It always comes back the same. So why bother? And the reason you want to bother is that sometimes a person using a, a reference optic might mistakenly bump it against something. It might drop it an inch or two onto the table. Um, it may get shipped to another facility and go through some very bad vibration environment or a large temperature swing, and it might change. So it's just as important to recalibrate your interferometer as it is to recalibrate your coordinate measuring machine. The one thing that I've always struggled with is I don't think, well, I think it's difficult to calibrate an interferometer as an instrument for measuring figure error, for measuring irregularity. I do think it's possible to calibrate your reference artifact without a doubt then you know all the tools the end position test or the or or measuring a perfect optic of course random ball test all that but the interferometer itself it's you know can we put a full traceable calibrated sticker on it <laughs> and 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 the answer i come always come back with is if it's lazing if the laser works then it's calibrated. You don't even, it's like if it gives a result, it works. Is that a true calibration of it? It's not, I would say no. I mean, when when we used to just measure fringes, we just used to look at the contour lines, right? There was no computers. Um, the The wavelength of a helium neon laser is, is determined by physics, right? It's not gonna change, but when you have a computerized interferometer, um, there are some things that um, can change over time. And, and there's in order to take the data and right, in order to take the data and divide it down into these little small pieces, there is a mechanism on the interferometer that causes the fringes to move. It's a, it's a um, phase, somehow you phase shift the data and that mechanism can fail or it can become nonlinear. Um, it can it can break. Somebody puts something too heavy on it or they they try to pick up the instrument using that um, which which does happen and they they can break um, <laughs> and they won't work properly. Um, and the software does a pretty good job of trying to correct for that as best it can, but not only should you have your um, accessories checked, but you should have somebody come in and service the instrument and run through a full set of tests to make sure that that is not a problem, that you haven't had issues, um, and that your instrument is working correctly. Yeah, phase shifter calibration. I didn't quite think of that. Well, any uh, any closing thoughts from either of you before we begin to uh, to wrap up this episode today? Anything you want to leave our audience uh, with, uh, or, or anything that we haven't touched on that you think is important to discuss when it comes to interferometry? 
you could talk for hours and days and build whole careers out of interferometry. Uh, so it's hard to wrap it up in a, in a short, in a short little time. Um, but I think it's, um, it, it, it is the best tool out there for doing what it does is really what it comes down to. And I'm going to make a statement, which may sound self-serving to the interferometer manufacturer, but you should Buy the best equipment you can when you need to buy the interferometers. And the reason I say that is, at least with our interferometers, they last a long time. We have people using instruments that are 30 years old. And uh, if you're going to be using something for that period of time, the quality of optics you're measuring today is probably going to, you're going to improve over time. And you really should plan ahead because you're going to have that equipment, which is quite expensive, but you're going to have it for a long time. So, you know, be careful when you choose it and buy the best you can afford at the time that you equip your labs because it will serve you well going into the future. Well, those are some uh, uh, fantastic way to tie a bow on this episode. It's been an absolute pleasure getting a chance to learn a little bit more uh, here in our intro to uh, laser interferometry here with Kate Medicus and Bruce Truex. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us here on this episode of Metrology Matters and uh, sharing your insights and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Metrology Matters. Stay tuned for our next episode, Tackling Uncertainty and Why the Word Accuracy is Actually Inaccurate. We'll talk about that in the next episode, and we'll build on the foundation discussed here today and discuss how users can address the next level of confidence in metrology results. So you'll want to make sure to stay tuned for that. Easiest way to do that is by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to Metrology Matters. There, you'll stay up to date with the latest episodes and get them right there on your uh, on your device, whatever that may be. So stay tuned for that. But for this episode, from my guests today, Bruce and Kate, I've been your host, Tyler Kern. Thanks so much for joining us.